Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1 as we continue our series in Revelation. And I want to remind you that uh, when we're done with chapter 1, then I'm going to, do, uh, I'm going to give you the program, uh, what's, what to look for uh, in the next uh, event, what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening with Russia. Everything that's going on today is not by accident. The Bible has predicted these events many, many thousands of years ago, but people didn't believe it. This generation is seeing it. And so um, we're going to give you the signs of, the, uh, of all, everything, and then uh, we'll go into the seven churches that are in chapter 2. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this, eve, uh, this morning. We thank you that we can come into your house. And Lord, we pray today, Lord, we know that many are not here today, uh, some because of families passing away and, and their home with uh, their relatives. And so we pray for those, Lord, especially uh, Susan and Masha who lost her, their mother this week. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you'd be with the family and uh, comfort them, Lord. And we know, Lord, some are not here because of the weather. So just be with them and take care of them, Father. Uh, as we enter your word, we pray, Holy Spirit, just God and direct, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the, let's look at verse number 9 and 10. And I, John, who is also am your brother, a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pegamus, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being <clears throat> turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about to the paths, and with a golden girdle. As we look at these uh, verses this morning, I probably won't get to all of them, but uh, very important this morning that we see John's vision. You're going to see John's vision in verses 9 through 20, which is very important here. This is the first of, the th of three great visions that he sees while he's writing down. He sees of Christ in the book of Revelation. Here it is a vision of Jesus Christ himself and his glory and exaltation as he proclaims his message to the seven churches, which we today need to heed. And also obey the messages that he gives these seven churches when we get there. So this is the first of three visions that John saw of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, number one, John identifies himself in verse number nine. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice this morning, he says that he is a brother. Did you catch that? Yes. He is a brother. In other words, he is a member of the family of God. Amen? Amen. Now, as you say, through faith in Jesus Christ, he is, and he says so himself. Remember, John also wrote the Gospel of John. Amen? Amen. So how do you know he's part of the family of God? Because turn with me to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1. And notice verse number 12. But as many as receive him, to them gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that what? Believe on his name. So John 1, 12 teaches us very clearly, if you want to become a member of the family of God, that you're going to have to put your total faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. Amen? You must be born again by the Spirit of God. Not everybody's a child of God. Get that, I wish the world would get that through their thick skulls. You hear that phrase a lot in religion. We're all part of the family of God. We're not. 
You're only part of the family of God when you repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, what in John 1? Then you become children of God. Amen? You're going to see later on as we go through Revelation, all the religions want to combine themselves into one. As uh, Mike sent me a thing on the Pope, man, that was, that was something. He believes everybody's a child of God. No, that's not true. That's not true. He identifies himself here as part of the family of God. He's a brother, in other words, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise God when you get saved this morning. You become born again. You become part of a family. Amen? The family of God. Get to know it. Get to know each other. Amen? 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 Amen. Know each other. Every time you see an empty pew, you know what you ought to be doing when you get home? Call. call. Hey, where were you? What's up? Missing you. I can only do so much. Matter of fact, it's expected of me. In which I don't mind. But you know what? I can only make so many calls. But you know what? If a member who's not here has been here, you know, a couple weeks, three, or even a month, or a long time, why don't you call them up and say, hey, we're missing you. What's going on? They need to hear from the family. Yeah. Right. Amen? Yeah. Open yourself up. Don't be afraid to make a call. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to send a card. <laughs> hey, miss you. We're part of a family. John says, hey, I'm your brother. I'm your brother. You know what's interesting with that statement when he says, I, John, who am your brother? How humble and loving is his attitude? In other words, there is absolutely no ecclesiastical dignity with him, is there? You know what I mean by ecclesiastical dignity? You know what I mean by that? John didn't sit there and put on a white collar and say, I'm, you know, I'm dignity here. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I'm suffering with Christ. You better pay attention to that. Look at me. No hierarchy here. He considered himself a brother in Jesus Christ to all those who are part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. Woe well, unto any leader, woe well, unto any pastor that exalts himself so high that he thinks he's better than the congregation. That pastor, no, in my eyes, he's not worth anything. I don't think he knows his calling. A pastor is called to be a servant. Neither does he know what spirit he's of. Yeah. <clears throat> the day I have to go up there and say, I'm the pastor, you better do what I tell you, I don't, then I shouldn't be in the pulpit. Amen. We're servants, amen? amen? You know, you realize you became a born-again believer? You became part of the family of God, and you have as much important in saying something as much as I do. That's right. That's right. Yes. Isn't there a First Corinthians twelve and thirteen talk about every one of you is an eye, a shoulder, a foot, an arm, a limb? No, we're all in it. What together? That's right. Nobody's above each other. No. Time to get out of the box. Pastor isn't a dictator. He's a, he can be the spiritual leader. But you know what? I appreciate my elders who have something to say. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they've said something. I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. I'm not the know-it-all guy. Mm -hmm. I'm just your servant. Mm -hmm. Wanting to be by your side. Mm -hmm. Loves to preach the word of God. Uh, Amen? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Then you take it and you do what God tells you to do. Amen? Amen. That's what it's all about. I praise God this church is getting out of that. Yes. Let me give you an example. <laughs> when, I first, when I first took over, I said, you know, it was like nobody dared to make a move until they called me. I said, what are you calling me for? If God has led you to do this, then do it. Do it. You don't need my permission. What's this permission from the pastor all about? Where did that come from? I never see that in Scripture. Now, I'm to lead and exhort. You know what my job is as a pastor? I am to pray, read the Word of God, and exhort and encourage 
and preach. Amen? Amen. That's my job. So if the Holy Spirit leads you to do something, you believe God's leading you to do it, then you don't need my permission. You already got permission from the Holy Spirit to do it. Amen? Amen. So do it. Now, I might be watching you <laughs> to make sure you're doing it okay. Yes, if you need instruction, amen? But man, people get excited. If God's telling you to do something, do it. Do you imagine if I had to, if everybody that came to me, we'd, we'd have to have a meeting 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Look what happened to Moses. Yeah, exactly. You want to burden the preacher down? You give everything to him. Let him make all the decisions. That's not biblical. No. Matter of fact, you study the history of the early church. That church was 30,000 membership. Do you think that those apostles could lead all of that? That's why they called up seven men to lead it. Because mm -hmm. one guy can't do it all. No, I praise God I don't do it all. Because I know me. This is me. I'm talking me here. If I had to do it all, I'd get a big head and I'd think, you know what? I'm, I'm, man, I'm somebody. Look at me. I can do this, that, and the other thing. I don't want to be in that position. Brothers and sisters, we're a family. Get involved, amen? amen. Get to know each other. Get to help each other. That's what it's all about. I want to encourage you to do that. John was a humble man. Notice, secondly, he notice he's a companion in tribulation in verse number 9. He can identify with them in their tribulations because he was enduring the same. During that time, the churches were going through much trial and tribulation, and he's going through it too. He was suffering for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? And boy, did he suffer. Do you realize that the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, when he hit the Isle of Patmos, he was boiled in oil? They literally took his body, boiled him in a boiling pot of oil, and they took him out and he survived. That man knew what it was like to suffer. Can you imagine the scars in his body after that? I'm glad I live in America. Amen. Whew. Notice 2 Timothy. Turn to me to 2 Timothy. And I want you uh, to notice chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want you to notice verse 12. The Bible says in verse 12, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer. Persecution. See, if we're living godly, you might not get boiled in oil, but you're going to suffer some kind of persecution. Yes. If you're living right with God, you, something's going to happen to us. You can count on it. If you're not living godly, then you've got nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. Except the judgment. Huh? Except the judgment seat. Except the judgment seat, yeah. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 17. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. You see the suffering again? Look at 1 Peter. Turn me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, But the grace of God, of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So here we see John, he was a companion in tribulation for the suffering of who? Jesus Christ. He realized who his Lord was, and he was willing to go through any type of suffering for the glory of God. My question is this morning, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? It might happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might happen. You never know 
who's going to be put in the White House after this election. We get a guy in here who wants to take away our religious freedom. We're going to know what it's like to suffer for Jesus Christ. You never know. He welcomed that tribulation. He is a companion also, verse 9, in our text, in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Whoa. You see, as a believer, he had been translated into the kingdom of Christ. In a spiritual and positional sense, we are already in the kingdom of Christ. Amen? Yes. The day you got saved spiritually, you became members of the kingdom of God. Amen? As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us in Romans that uh, the kingdom of God, what? Lives within us. Yes. So everywhere you go, you, we represent the kingdom of God. Amen? Yes. So in other words, if people want to know what the kingdom of God is like, then they're going to watch... Us. Yes. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are the kingdom of God on earth right yes. now. Mm -hmm. It dwells in every individual born again believer. Amen. Wow. <coughs> you see, in the physical sense, we are waiting for the establishment of, of that thousand year reign, that kingdom of Christ. And one day it will come, according to Colossians 1. 13. It's going to come. But until that time, we represent the kingdom of God. Now, that ought to get you thinking, amen? That ought to get you wake. That, that should wake you up. Here's the point. We must wait patiently for the kingdom of Christ, just like John was. Wait patiently for it through all the difficulties of this present life, we shall wait patiently for it. Romans chapter 8, turn over there. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, notice verse 24. It says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen... Is not hope for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we uh, th then do we with what? Patience wait for it. No, I I, I have do you, you realize this morning, if you're saved this morning, you put your faith and belief in Jesus Christ, whom you have not Same. seen. My hope is in somebody I have not seen. But I'm going to wait patiently because one day I'm going to see him. Amen? Amen. So wait for him. Mm -hmm. Be patient. You don't think John, after what he went through and his suffering, you think he wanted to see Christ right then and there? He said, nope, I just got to wait patiently and suffer as I do it. But I'm going to wait patiently for him. I've seen, I've seen through the years, and rightly so, Pastor, I can't wait till Jesus comes. I can't wait to see him face to face. Amen? Amen. Well, what if it doesn't happen in 20, 30 years? You're going to have the patience still to wait? Yes. Wait patiently for him. Remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way and the sin which does e so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. patience the race that is set before us. The set before us. Wait patiently. Jesus is coming back again. Amen. But we have to wait patiently. You know what? If he if he if he doesn't come today. There must be a reason for it. Right. Yep, God's, all, God's never early. He's never late. Right. He's always on time. Amen. And so if he doesn't come today, I hope he does. But if he doesn't, okay, Lord, you must have a plan for me tomorrow. Wait patiently for him. Many believers must be patient in afflictions because patience is the result of the process of our Christian growth. Amen? You must remember that. We will always grow in trials and tribulations. 
You don't grow on a mountaintop. You grow in the valley. You grow through the hard times. So every time you go through a trial and tribulation, just praise God for it. Because when it's all done, you're going to come out spiritually better than you were before. So praise God for those times. He's going to teach you something. You're going to, we're going to learn something. Amen? And that's for always for His benefit. Because you know, the more we grow spiritually, the more He can use us. For his glory. Amen. And notice secondly, John describes the circumstances of his vision in verse number 9 also. He was, he was uh, exiled on this island called Patmos in verse number 9. Now this island sat out in the sea. It was 10 miles long and 6 miles wide. It was an isolated, barren, <laughs> rocky place with hills rising as high as a thousand feet. So nobody could escape. If you did make the cliffs, then you had all the ocean. It's kind of like Alcatraz. So John was, uh, was exiled to that place. God has given many revelations. You realize to people in times of exiles and trials... I believe God put him there so God could give him a vision of the revelation. He needed to be alone in exile so God could get his attention. Scripture's full of examples like that. Did you know this morning while in exile, Jacob saw God at Bethel and was taught many spiritual lessons in Genesis chapter 28? He got him alone. He wrestled. Remember, he wrestled with an angel of God all night and walked out with a limp. He was alone, exiled. Yeah. Do you realize tonight that while that in exile, Joseph became the revelator of seekers and eventually became the leader of Egypt? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was while he was in prison, exiled. While in exile, Moses was prepared to be the leader of God's people and, and saw God at the burning bush. He was in exile. David wrote the Psalms while in exile, running for his life from cave to cave. And he would be the next king of Israel. Elijah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Paul the Apostle was given mysteries uh, concerning the church, all alone in exile in the desert. Did you realize that? Right. Look at Galatians chapter 1. <laughs> In Galatians chapter 1, notice uh, verse 15. Galatians chapter 1, and beginning in verse number 15. Paul says, But when it pleased God who shepherded me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto where? Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. God sent the apostle Paul into the desert of Arabia to be trained and taught the mysteries of God for how long? Three years. Uh, this morning, do you feel like you've been in the desert for a long time? Oh, yeah. Well, guess what? God's got you there to train you for something. It's a normal pattern. It's normal. The dry places. Yeah, the dry places. Amen. That's good for us. It's good for us. And so we see that he was exiled. So if you feel like you're in exile this morning, good. Praise God, Praise God for it. Yeah. You, you're going to get some training. Mm -hmm. Notice also, he was there for the sake, verse 9, of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This was the purpose of his tribulation and his imprisonment. He was there for 
preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and claiming He is the only Lord and Savior. That's why He was there. He was also, the Bible says, in the Spirit. Did you catch that? In verse 10, He was filled with the Holy Spirit and controlled by the Spirit all the time that He was there. Like Paul and Barnabas in prison, John was enjoying his tribulation by walking in fellowship with the Lord God Almighty. You see, he wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. All this time on the island, he was having sweet, intimate, personal fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen? He was being filled with the Spirit of God every day, communicating with the Spirit of God. That is very so so important, people, because listen, John was prepared to receive the revelation that was given to him. In other words, it is necessary to walk in the Spirit in order to receive the wisdom of God. Amen? And to understand God's Word properly. In other words, you cannot understand things in the carnal state. If you want to understand the spiritual walk, if you want to understand the, the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, then you've got to enjoy Him. You've got to be filled with Him because you will never understand the things of God or even interpret the Word of God if we're in the flesh. Amen? Amen? So whatever you do and say, believer, you better be walking in the Spirit of God before you make a move. Amen? Amen? I try to my very best. I don't make a move unless the Holy Spirit tells me to make a move. You know what? I don't care what the elders say. Or what the people say. Something to think about, huh? I never want to make a move with the body of Christ if I make that move in the flesh. Patience. Now, if you want to go for it, go for it. But when I make a move, I want to make sure it's 100% led by the Spirit of God. 1% led by me, it's going to fail. That's how important this is. Amen? Amen yeah. Come on, people. Let's be honest. How many decisions have we made in our Christian life we made in the flesh and regretted it later? Yeah. I have. <laughs> you see, John here was filled with the Spirit of God. And that's why he could enjoy his fellowship and tribulation and with Christ. That's why he could enjoy it. Once again, you cannot understand the leading of the Spirit or get the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It cannot be, you cannot understand it in a cardinal state. 1 Corinthians 3, turn over there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want you to notice verse 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to what? To bear it, neither yet now are you what? Oh. You know what's hard for a pastor and elders? When we get to... When we get to in, meetings and stuff, is that we have to understand the body of Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. And if a body of Christ is still in a baby stage, we could say things, do things to the cows come home, but they're not going to respond because they're still in the baby stage. So what do we do? You have to have patience and patience until they get out of that baby stage and, and attack it every now and then say, get out of this thing, come on, let's move on. Until then, you can't do nothing. You ever try to witness somebody who's carnal? 
You get anywhere with them? <laughs> all you get is arguments and fights. That's all you get. You know, that's the same thing with the body of Christ. Same thing with a local church membership. If they're, if they're not growing spiritually, there's going to be one fight after another fight after another fight. Until they get together and say, it's time to grow up. We've got to get out of this baby stage and move on. Right. Amen? And it does happen. I'm, it does happen. I'm seeing it happen here. I don't hear, I'll, I hardly hear anything now. Very rare I hear, well, we used to do it that way, Pastor. Get out of that mode of thinking. Yeah. Look where it got you. It, always got, it got your doors almost closed, didn't it? Almost. New day. New leadership. New time. I'm glad it's working. Amen. It's exciting to see it work. Amen? You've got to realize, as a group and as a body, you have different stages. A church goes through different growth spurts. Always does. So I'm excited. Praise God, to, you know. Get out of the carnality and into the fruit of the Spirit. Spiritual. Why do you think I preached on spiritual warfare so hard? <laughs> Why do you think I preached on, I was telling my Sunday school class, on finding and knowing God's will? Does this body know what God's will is? Now don't shake and say, yeah. Don't say that too quickly. Do you really know where God wants us and where he wants us and what he wants us to do? Ah, be careful with that. We're learning in our science school class. A lot of churches, a lot of membership, they've never experienced God. That's right. They know all about Him. That's right. Yeah. But they've never, they don't know what it's like to have a vibrant yeah. experience yes. with God. Hallelujah. That's where it's at. Yeah. Are you inviting God into your life? There's an invitation that God wants to have with you every day. Amen. Are you experiencing it? Amen. I hope so. God is not a concept of doctrine. <laughs> He's a real, personal, intimate God. Amen. Are you experiencing the abundant life? Do you know for sure God is speaking to you? And when he, uh, do you know He's speaking to you? Do you hear Him every day you, of your life? Right. Or are you just, I'm saved, praise the Lord. Yawn. Huh? Yawn. Yawn, yeah. <laughs> Listen, let Him get involved with your life. Amen. That's right. Get excited about that. Christians today, well, I got Jesus, that's it. Put God on a shelf. And when I need him, I'll take him off and dust him off a little bit. And every day, God's saying, here I am. Let me into your life, believer. Let me get involved in your life. Let me take you and mold you and shape you and direct you. Amen? Man. God is the greatest thing that ever entered our lives. Amen? Amen. Then why do we throw him out so quickly? You see, John had a wonderful experience of knowing Jesus Christ in a personal and intimate way. <laughs> and even on the Isle of Patmos, he had sweet fellowship with Jesus and got new visions and wisdom from God. Boom. Yeah. Even on a small island. How big's your island this morning, believer? That's it. Oh, better yet, it's God there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm never going to get through these. <laughs> Verse 10. That's 
It was the Lord's Day. Did you catch that? It was the Lord's Day. That's an interesting statement. This is Sunday, the resurrection day, the first day of creation. You see, our calendar, we usually think Monday's the first day of the week. It is not. Sunday's the first day of the week. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. The Christians have worshipped on the day of resurrection since the beginning of Acts. They met on the first day of the week, preached and broke bread. Every Sunday. Acts 27 will tell you that. 1 Corinthians 16 and Mark 16 will tell you that. Here's the point. Before I finish verse 10, notice how God met John's need. John was alone, stranded on an island that was barren and isolated as could be. There's nothing there. Except guards. Imagine being alone. Picture John this morning. Imagine John alone, banished from society, loved ones, and his friends, but John knew Jesus. Yes. Christ met his need right there on that island. Amen? You see, people, if you're truly born again this morning, you're never alone. No matter what island you're on. You might feel lonely. You might feel damaged from society. You might not even see your loved ones or your friends, but you've got one friend, the Bible says, that sticks closer than a brother. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You see, He'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then, notice the vision, verse 10 through 16. The Bible says, John heard a great voice, verse 10 and 11. Now that voice, when you heard a great voice, the voice was great, meaning it was loud and very powerful. That's what the Greek word means. In other words, it wasn't, such, it wasn't something loud, like a normal loud, like a, you know, every day you get up and hear loud noises. This thing was a tremendous boom that got his attention. Surely it took John for surprise and probably shocked him. God's voice is a great is great and important, and men must heed to the voice of God or they perish. Amen? Yes. Why won't people listen to God's voice? They better. Or they perish. Mm -hmm. I love it. Wow. See, the voice sounded like what? A trumpet. Oh, now that ought to get your attention. Mm -hmm. Like a trumpet? Yeah. It was loud, it was clear, it was forceful. It's, a trumpet sounded in Israel's time. It signified authority. The first mention of a trumpet in the Bible, um, did you realize, was Mount Sinai at the giving of the law in Exodus chapter 19. The group got there and doo -doo 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 -doo, boom. And then the voice of God came. And you notice what the people did? They trembled. Listen, trumpets were used to call Israel to assembly for battle, for special religious occasions, for coronations, for feasts, and for worship. It was intended. Why did they blow the trumpet first? Why? It was to get the attention to make people stop what they were doing and listen to what God had to say. Think about that. <coughs> Praise God, the trumpet is even associated with the return of Christ. Amen? But here's the point I want to make. Listen, what, is, what does God have to do to get you to listen to Him? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Boom! Yeah, right. He's going to get your attention somehow. 
And when he does, you need to pay attention to what he has to say. Here's my point I want to make. Yes, those of us who are born again and who are saved, he is our father, amen? Amen. 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 But I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes Christians get too comfortable with God. You better fear him also. And when the day that we get so comfortable of God being our father, that we look at him as a, just as a daddy, you got another thing coming. The Bible also says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Amen? Though we're shamed, though he's our father, we still better have a healthy respect for who he is. Amen? Amen. And he's going to do whatever it takes to get our attention. Amen. That's right. And the key is, though, when he, get, when he gets our attention... We got to do something. Praise God. And in times of our life, <laughs> He does get our attention. Yeah, amen. Amen? amen? He has to. Because you know what? We're human beings. And we get down in our set patterns and our ways. And God's trying to say, hey, you know, hey. Tries to speak to us, but we're so busy. And God says, okay, I guess I got to put a trumpet on him. I guess I'm going to have to make something loud to stop them in their tracks to look up. So what's it going to take? It's up to God. It's really up to him what it takes. But when he speaks, Listen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Praise God that John was alone on the aisle. Praise God that he was a brother, part of the family of God. Amen? Amen. But what I praise God the most, even though he was alone on an island, He had fellowship yes. with the Holy Spirit of God yes. Yes. that taught him yes. what to do. Yes. Yes. Believer, is the Holy Spirit, do you know him so well mm -hmm. that when he speaks, do you know what to do? If you don't, you're still in a carnal state. I challenge you to get out of it and get to know the Holy Spirit of God. Don't let the charismatic ruin the right. working of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Those people are wrong what they teach their people. But it is biblical to know to be filled with the Holy Spirit Amen. where you will find wisdom Amen. and power to walk your Christian walk. Amen? It's a beautiful gift of God. So use it. Use Him today and every day of your life. Father, thank You. And I pray this morning, if there's one here that's not saved, oh, they might know God intellectually, but do they have an experience a vital relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Master. If they do not know that, may they come forward this morning and be saved and know that wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. And Father, help us as believers to be so in tune with your Holy Spirit. Not only will we get wisdom and knowledge, but Holy Spirit, transform us. We need to walk in your power and not in our flesh. Help us to know you even better. Yes. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.